This is Debbie Dashinger inviting you to join me and some amazing presenters aboard the Galactic Origin Celebrity Cruise to the Yucatan in December. Go to D-E-B-B-I, D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R dot com slash cruise. Welcome to the award-winning Dare to Dream podcast with Debbie Dashinger, covering metaphysics, ETs, shamanism, and channeling. Here you will find spiritual inspiration from today's thought leaders, along with cutting-edge insights from our interstellar brothers and sisters and ancient shamanic wisdom. Now, here's a new episode of Dare to Dream with your host, Debbie Dashinger. Hello, hello. I am so excited to be here, Lightworkers, because today I am speaking with my dear friend, Debbie Solaris. The Debbies are here again to bring you a heck of a show. Debbie Solaris is an ET contactee, Ascension coach, and galactic historian. And today we are speaking about everything, Lyra, 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 and Lyran. So stay tuned. If you're curious about that, we're going deep. This show has won many awards, and I'm super grateful for the acknowledgement. The Positive Talk Change Awards, three of them, the COVR Award for Best Radio Podcast Show, Walt Magazine named Dare to Dream, one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to, high ranking also on Apple Podcasts. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and access consciousness. They do energy work out into the world. And if you'd like to become a facilitator, go to one of the classes, go to Dr. Dane here, H-E-E-R.com. Also, something Debbie and I put together for you is a starseed video and report. If you want to know what your galactic ancestry is, you can unlock your cosmic potential with this free starseed video and report. You can explore up to 19 different galactic starseeds. It is captivating information and find out your galactic origins. Don't miss the chance to learn your star lineage. Go to debbiedashinger.com slash starseed. That's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R dot com slash starseed. Well, Debbie Solaris is here today because I asked her to. The Debbie and Deb are both going to be speaking coming up October 5th at an online Liren conference. And when I found out that Debbie is doing a presentation and that I didn't get to interview her, ask her questions as the MC of the Liren conference, I was uber bummed and she said, and I said, let's just do this together because first we want to let you know about the Liren conference and other amazing things we're doing together, including a galactic cruise in December. Everything will be in the show notes, by the way, and then we'll also give out the information as we go along. So you can join all of these things, the Liren conference, the galactic cruise in December to the Yucatan that we'll both be on. But today we are bringing you this show specifically to deep dive into Lyra and Lyrans. Little bit about Debbie, if you don't know yet, she's an ET contactee, interdimensional traveler, and galactic historian. After a fateful extraterrestrial contact experience aboard an Arcturian starship, Debbie awakened to her true star lineage and her higher calling. Through her ancestral connection with the Akashic Records, she's been receiving downloads of galactic historical information and universal spiritual knowledge ever since. Debbie feels it's a big part of her mission while she's here on Earth to help awaken others to their own true divine selves and cosmic origins. You can go to her website and learn more at DebbieSolaris.com. Com. And with that, I welcome my dear friend, Debbie, to Dare to Dream. Welcome back. Thanks for having me on. It's great to be back. It's always, it feels like a homecoming every time I come <laughs> here. So it's, uh, it's great to be um, part of the Debbie Debbie team, Debbie Squared teams. <laughs> yeah, I'm realizing we're going to have to set up a playlist exclusively for you on YouTube at this point, because we've I know, probably been, gotten to that turning point where there's enough that people who want to just go through them can do so. Yeah. So thanks for agreeing to do this. Um, 
Okay, here's where I want to start because, wow, this could be a series for sure. Oh, but for sure. It's a fascinating conversation, this Lyra, right? So Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you to start, Deb, with can you describe the Lyran beings and what the Lyran's role is in the seeding of life across different star systems? It's something I talk about all the time. So, uh, you know, I'll start off with how I got introduced to Lyra or Lyra, you know, however you want to pronounce it. I think both ways are fine to pronounce it. But um, so when I had my awakening, uh, this was back in 2012, I started getting downloads of galactic information. Like, I mean, massive, massive downloads. And one of the very first star systems that I got introduced to after the Arcturians were the Larens. And I saw their whole history, their whole story in this kind of, um, I want to say it was a download, but it was also kind of a past life regression, you know, for myself, um, because I just started seeing, you know, what, what I was doing on Lyra. Um, I was there as an Arcturian emissary trying to help the Lyrans with their evolution. And I saw exactly everything that happened with, you know, their interactions with the Draconians and how that all came about. And it was so traumatizing to see what happened to Lyra after the start of the Lyran Draconian Wars that I cried for months uh, I, I, I honestly, I was, tr- I was re-traumatized. I, I, every single day I was crying over Lyra and it got to the point where, you know, I can't keep crying all the time. I got to do something about this. So I had a, uh, I scheduled a past life regression session with, uh, my dear friend and, uh, and a mentor, uh, her name was Michelle Manny. She was native American and, you know, very connected with, you know, the star, star races. And so we did this regression. Um, and now I'm able to talk about Lyra and not be crying, you know, so, um, because there was a lot of wonderful things about the Laren culture. Um, you asked about the races. Um, so I'll start off with that. Um, so Lyra was kind of a work in progress, you know, so initially, when the co-creator beings came in through another, uh, so they came into our universe from another universe. And there was two uh, co-creator types. There was the avian beings and the the Lyran, uh, I don't even want to call them Lyran yet because they were actually from another universe, but they were the felines. Um, so these were uh, master geneticist beings, you know, so both of them, uh, have been uh, creating new universes for millennia. Uh, and, you know, so a lot of people think that, oh, you know, these genetics, they originated here in this galaxy. No, they actually originated, they were kind of a composite of genetics that have been replicated throughout multiple of uh, multiple universes for millennia. Um, And so now it was our universe's turn to go through this process of separation from source. And so they had to bring in these beings and they were in etheric form. So they weren't quite physical. uh, So they were like light beings, but they had like a feline-esque form or the avians had their, you know, avian form. Um, And so these beings came in through the Antares Stargate, which is in the constellation of Scorpio. So that is the portal that brings in these higher dimensional beings into our reality. And so these beings pretty much, uh, um, pretty much initially set up shop in the uh, galactic, uh, galactic center, which is between Scorpio and Sagittarius. And then Um, So they were trying to figure out, okay, what's the best way of going about creating these physical realities? And they picked a small, tiny little, um, little, little constellation. So they didn't even really pick Cygnus or they could have picked Cygnus. They didn't pick Cygnus, um, even though Cygnus is huge. 
because there's a big black hole in the middle of Cygnus. Cygnus was not safe. I mean, it was okay, but it wasn't uh, really compatible for uh, long-term, you know, physical reality. Um, so they ended up picking a Lyra, uh, which is right next door to Cygnus because Lyra had the conditions most favorable for physical life. So even today, when we read about, you know, inhabitable exoplanets, I don't know, I, I like to follow a lot of these, um, astro uh, not astrology, but as um, astronomy uh, sites. Um, so I follow a lot of those. And uh, they in, in cosmos.com, There was an article about the 10 uh, inhabitable exoplanets, and five of those 10 planets actually were located in Lyra, and that's present time Lyra, okay? So this is how important this, this little factoid is, because uh, these beings were intelligent. They knew that they if they were going to create physical life, they had to create it in a system that could support it, and that was Lyra. Um, So for that reason, um, these beings initially came in in etheric form, and they were continuously creating physical versions of themselves. You know, so they initially created this physical avian race that a lot of people now know as the avians. Um, they were descended from the carrions that came from alternate universes. Um, And then there was the feline beings. Uh, now, the felines were actually more well-versed in creating physical sentient beings. And the avian beings were more well-versed in creating uh, environments, realities, you know, planets, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, and so these beings were working together. And... the feline beings were creating uh, physical versions of themselves, you know, that were kind of humanoid, but they had like the lion head or they had the, you know, the, the feline head. And I know you personally have had your own soul memories of being one of these beings, you know, so um, that's why your music group is called the Lions of Lyra, you know, so um And so a lot of us, I think, really feel connected to felines for that reason, because our genetics came from the felines. Um, and uh, so, the, so they were continuously creating different versions. And so initially they might have looked like, you know, these uh, like Sekhmet or something, you know, like they had a human body, but they had like a, a, a feline head. Um, and then eventually they became... these, these, uh, they were trying to create beings that could stay in physicality longer. So this is kind of what happened was that they would create these feline beings and they would ascend too fast because they were very high vibrational, you know, so they couldn't stay physical for very long. So they had to continuously recreate beings that would be able to stay in physicality longer. So that's how the humanoid form came about. Um, now, the humanoid form is a the, the Adamic, um, the Carmen, the Adamic Carmen form has been replicated in multiple universes. So they knew that this template would work, you know, so they weren't just creating something out of nothing. They have used this template before. And so that's why, you know, a lot of us nowadays have this kind of human look about us. Um, we don't really look, some of us, I think you look very feline <laughs> even now, but um, that's why a lot of us don't have, you know, a lot of the, the, the feline form anymore, but we still carry those genetics. And the avians also contributed some of their genetics to the human form. Um, I, I have, I've had a lot of Akashic clients throughout the years that remember being able to fly or having wings or having dreams that they used to fly, you know, so, and I don't think it was just made up stuff. I think, they were probably having soul memories. So that's the, the first two co-creator beings. Um, now there is the Elohim. Um, so the Elohim were 
kind of like the offshoot of this co-creator um, group that was more the overall organizers of this experiment of separation from source. Um, and so these beings had more of a humanoid appearance. Um, also, they were very super high vibrational beings or high dimensional beings. So we're talking about 12th dimensional beings here. Um, and so a lot of people connect with these beings. I know you have a, a personal family connection with the Elohim. So, um, you know, so I, I, I know a little bit about Debbie's story because I've done readings for her. So, um, um, so there's that as well. Um, but I ask you when you say that, because somebody once posted a question under another show you and I did, so we'll answer their question by virtue of being Elohim or having galactic lineage there. Does that necessarily mean also they were Lyran or they, are they actually separate? I actually see the Elohim as being kind of the overseers of the whole reality. So just because you have a connection with the Elohim doesn't necessarily mean you have a connection with Lyra, but a lot of people that are connected to the Elohim have connections with Lyra because that was a pet project that they were working on, you know? So, um, so I would say yes and no to that. Um, but that's a great question because, um, it is one that can get really confusing, you know? So, cause I think, you know, a lot of times people think, oh, the Elohim, they were Lyrans. They weren't, they were above the Lyrans, if that makes sense, you know, in a, in a sense, they were, they're kind of like the galactic referees, if you want to use, you know, <laughs> earth terminology, you know, like they're kind of, you know, keeping things on the, on the level, you know, so, um, and they're, um, they still interact with us today, you know, so that, so we still have connections with the Elohim, you know, some people channel them directly, some, you know, some people have connections with them. Uh, and so and some people have them as guides, you know, so that's, there's that as well. Um, so because they were trying to create beings that could stay in physicality longer, um, they created the two human races. Um, and there were subcategories of these two human races, but just to keep things simple, um, we're going to just talk about these two human races. Um, so the first race they created was the Vagan race that lived in the planets that revolved around Vega. Um, Vega being the major star in the Lyra constellation. It's also known as Alpha Lyrae. Um, it was actually Earth's North Star in the beginning. So in the beginning, Earth was actually directly aligned with Vega. And it's actually going to be returning to Vega again, maybe a few thousand years from now, but eventually we'll shift back to Vega. Uh, so... These beings were the representation of mother goddess consciousness. So these beings were, um, uh, were, were created to be the more divine feminine uh, aspects of the human race. Um, so uh, I've done quite a few Akashic readings for many, many people throughout the years and um, certainly have had my fair share of vegan star seeds and a lot of times these people are darker skinned. Um, I wouldn't say all the time, uh, cause I do get some light skinned vegan souls, but, um, but for more often than not, I would say, um, our genetics, as far as our dark skin genetics, uh, so all, all the darker skinned folks, um, their genetics at, at some point originated from Vega. Um, so and, and it's kind of like a long history of, you know, okay, after the wars, the vegan people went to Sirius and then they went to Orion and a lot of dark skinned individuals originated from Orion, you know, so there's this whole story behind it. Um, so it's kind of interesting because sometimes I get questions from people that say, well, you never talk about black people. And I say, yeah, I do. I talk about them a lot. It's just their skin used to be blue. Okay. So, so it wasn't that I'm not talking about brown skin people. There was a lot of brown skin genetics. Um, it's just that um, initially in the higher dimensions, the skin was blue. 
Um, so that's why we see these depictions of Vedic gods that had, you know, beautiful blue skin and they were amazing beings and they were visiting Earth, you know, and they were visiting, you know, uh, Western Asia, you know, which is, uh, you know, Nepal and, uh, and India and those, you know, locations, you know, so, you know, Sri Lanka and all that. Uh, so those beings uh, were vegans and Uh, these beings were more consciously connected with spirituality and healing. So they were a little bit more reserved. Um, they were a little bit more focused on being more receptive. Um, and so they were a little more reserved. Um, and these beings were uh, actually, because they were very practical on top of being very spiritual, they had decent technology. I mean, their te technology was quite advanced. Um, now, on the flip side, we got the, the Caucasian white larynx. Uh, and those beings were created to be the father god consciousness representation. So we have to go back to the, uh, the original template of Source, where when Source split itself off, it initially split itself off into father god consciousness and mother goddess consciousness. So, um, so we always follow that template throughout, you know, this universe. And, uh, and so when they created these human beings, they were, you know, these human races, they were trying to stick with that same template. So these white larins were more, more Caucasian looking and they had lighter skin, lighter hair. Um, now both of these races were tall, um, So a lot of people think, oh, they were like Earth humans. Mm -mm. They were higher dimensional humanoids. So they were extremely tall. I think the Vegans were like 12 to 15 feet. The Lyrans were almost as tall as that, maybe 10 feet. I don't know, but they were tall. Okay. So, and they were big beings. Um, and so these beings, uh, the Father God consciousness, Lyrans were. the representation of masculine energy. So they were more action oriented beings. Uh, so these beings were more physical. So they were more interested in farming and sports and physical activities. Um, and we see that even today with Lair and Starseeds that a lot of them are very physical. You know, they like getting involved with physical activities, whereas the vegan people are more self-reflective. So mm -hmm. these are the folks that are probably more interested in more, uh, I would say, spiritual pursuits as opposed to physical pursuits. Um, and so, so these two races were coexisting with each other. They were just like, you know, yeah, you know, they were, you know, they were just kind of doing their, staying in their lane, doing their thing. And, Um, there was also some, you know, offshoots. So there was the redheaded genetics came from Lyra. Um, a lot of people always ask me, where did the redheads come from? That genetic came from Lyra. <laughs> so, so they were, they were the extremely psychic uh, offshoot subgroup of the Caucasian Lyran race. Um, so these, these beings, um, and I would say redheads even here on earth, have certain genetic components that sets them apart from other, you know, uh, hair color, you know, skin, you know, coloring, you know, kind, kind of combinations because their genetics came directly from Lyra. And That is so interesting. they were known to be more uh, physical or uh, no more psychic rather more Psychic. psychic. Uh, so they're more psychic. So let Uh, me ask you this, if I may. Yeah. Why, why here? So I'm not going to go into the war because I, you and I have talked about this Yeah. before and you've gone beautifully and deeply into it. So why then did the lion beings incarnate into this particular galaxy? What was their reasoning to have interactions with earth and humanity? That's uh that's a question I'm going to try to answer uh briefly, but probably I could spend 5 hours on it, but um But just to give you kind of the brief overview answer to that. Um, so each multi-universe goes through a process of separation from source. And uh, so it was just our universe's turn. You know, it was just like, okay, 
okay, we're getting ready to do this in this universe. Um, it's a free will universe. Um, but we need to bring in some beings to kickstart this whole process. And so because the lion beings and the felines have done it in multiple universes, they were experienced, you know, they just knew what to do, you know, so, so they were just kind of like the genetic uh, masters, you know, they just came in, they knew what to do. Um, uh, I would say that's the main reason um, why this particular galaxy, that's another story. Okay. So, Initially, um, this experiment was supposed to happen in the Andromeda galaxy because it was a big galaxy and they figured, you know, hey, it's a galaxy that is very high vibrational and, you know, we can do a lot, but they were finding in Andromeda that they couldn't sustain lower dimensional physical life. Um, so uh, the Andromeda Galaxy group, along with the lion beings, along with the avians, uh, and I actually believe that the avians were kind of like, uh, like the Andromeda Galaxy group was kind of an offshoot of the avians, actually, um, because a lot of times when I see them, they have wings, you know, they just, when I see them in the records, they always have these massive wings. Um, and so they decided, you know what, we need to create a lower dimensional galaxy that is kind of like the, a carbon copy of Andromeda galaxy, but not as high vibration. When we're in Andromeda galaxy, we're talking about 20th dimension. I mean, this is like multiple, you know, high level dimensions. Uh, so they had to create kind of a, um, a lower dimensional version of it. And so they created the Milky Way. And so that's why these beings were coming in because, you know, they were very vested in their project. You know, there was a massive project. They had, you know, this is something that was started billions and billions of years ago. And so they were just thinking, you know, hey, you know, we're invested in this project. We want to see it succeed. So we're going to have to actually be a part of this galaxy if we're going to see this succeed. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question exactly. But, it does. It yeah. does. And that so... I have heard that only 0.3% of the population on Earth is of Lyran descent. How does that jive with what you know? I would say it's more than that. Um, I think Lyran genetics is pretty widespread. Um, I mean, all of hum human genetics, um, Lyra was called the home of human consciousness for a reason. Mm -hmm. It's where... The, the original human template began. Um, and so I don't know if I buy into only 0.3%. That just seems kind of low. It uh, seems very low, yeah. Yeah, I mean, because I've done thousands of Akashic readings uh, probably in the last decade. And I've seen a lot of star seeds that have connections to Lyra, both mm -hmm. physically and soul, you know, their soul markers also originated from Lyra. So I would say it's probably much higher than that. Now, I would say the majority of Earth genetics actually originated from Sirius. So the Syrians had more of the direct effect on the Earth genome, you know, human genome project. But where did the Syrian genetics came from? They came from Lyra. OK, so, you know. <laughs> I got it. So the tie in is there. You know, you yeah. also you're talking about these tall beings, and I know with Lyrans often, they're very physical, very athletic. Mm -hmm. And I think about people like Jerry Sargent, mm -hmm. tall guy, um, nicely built. I think mm -hmm. about Ishmael Perez, who strongly identifies with Lyra. And I don't even know, I'm only 5'4". I don't even know how tall he is, but I know when I stand next to Ishmael, I'm I'm looking up. I think up, he's I'm well over he's six feet. Six I've, I've, I've stood next to him too. Six he... four, maybe. Holy God! But yeah. he, and he's like, boof. like he fits that. I feel like what happened? <laughs> what happened over here? So for those of us who don't identify with that oof, beefy kind of mm. physicality, mm. I can identify with. I mean in. In my looking into Lyran, so for instance, they also say that we're strongly 
identified with our sexuality. And Mm -hmm. that feels very right to me. Like, I feel like I've been in Egypt with uh, the divine sexuality, with the temples of Isis, Mary Magdalene and all that. Mm -hmm. But as far as the athletic, the, you know, to a point, yes. Yeah, to a point. Yeah. You know, it's kind of interesting because my my husband is Laren Syrian and Mm. he's extremely athletic. I mean, Mm. he is just like, He's not super tall like Ishmael. Um, he's actually more of a lean body type, but um, but he's extremely athletic. Like that's all he lives for is, wow. you know. Yeah. Um, so so the, that's where the Lyra genetics show up in him. But I think, you know, because we are a composite of different genetic types here on Earth, um, we might have gotten some of our genetics from Lyra, but we also might have gotten some of our genetics from Arcturus or from uh, I don't know, um, you know, maybe Pleiades, you know, the Pleiadians were not quite as tall. They're pretty tall, but they were not quite as tall as the Larens, you know, so maybe you had some lifetimes in the Pleiades or in Sirius, you know, who knows? Um, so that might contribute to maybe why you're not quite that kind of physical, both boofy type of person. Um, uh, but, I do think um, you you do, when I look at you, you look Laren to me. I mean, I, I do see quite a bit of the Lyra genetics in you. It's just, you didn't, you didn't get the height and the, the build, you know, but, um, and uh, I would say that's true of a lot of us, you know, we're kind of like a Heinz 57 here on <laughs> Earth. Many different star, you know, star DNA from different star systems. And so we probably got genetics from all kinds of different places, you know, but, um, but we have to have that genetic marker, you know, in order for our soul to connect with our, you know, our physical bodies, there, there has to be a certain percentage of DNA from that soul origination point in order for us to connect. So I would say you got, you got quite a bit of Lyra in you. You got, you know, you got the lion hair and, you know, the, the physical features for sure. Um, but yeah, I don't have, I'm not very tall either. And supposedly um, Arcturian beings um, in their lower dimensional form are not that tall, you know, so it's, it is what it is, but, um, but yeah, interesting question though. Um, but I do see quite a few of Lyran star seeds that love, they love sports. They, I don't know. I would, I would say that is probably one of the trends I see the most is that um, at some, some level, you know, okay. So, you know, some of them might really love running and then others of them might really love um, biking or they might love weight, you know, weight training, you know, that sort of thing. I see a lot of them that go into weight training actually, but um uh, in my I, husband's case, it's more the team sports. He likes, uh, you know, baseball and um, golf awesome. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. All right. Um, that is interesting because I have seen Terry. I've met him. So, you know, it's good to have these reference points for yeah. those things. In my last galactic reading with you, I'm going to give you some license here, I think, to get something out of your system. You mentioned Merope and Maya from the play. Pleiadian constellation, Debbie, and you said, this is rarely ever discussed. Why? So I'm going to ask you to explore why Merope, why Maya, and how is it important to the Lyran conversation? Interesting. Um, Yeah, I kind of, you know, I've been following, you know, the Starseed community for, you know, at least over a decade now. And you know, nobody ever really talks about those Pleiadian systems. And it kind of irks me because they were so important to our overall human development. You know, I mean, it's like, if we didn't have Merope and Maya, we wouldn't have the Native American, you know, communities here on earth. I mean, we wouldn't have shamanism, we wouldn't have nature religion. I mean, there's so much that came from those systems it almost makes me wonder sometimes if they were being purposefully hidden, like, you know, maybe they don't want us to connect with our origins from those systems. But, um, but I've, I've, I'm a soul that have, in addition to being Arcturian, I've had a lot of incarnations in the Pleiades and I have a lot of soul memories of these places. So, um, so I've, 
I've spent a lot of time in the Pleiades. And so I know these systems. I mean, I know they all had their own, uh, you know, uh, view, uh, I, I would say civilizations and culture, you know, so, uh, so just to talk on Merope first, and then we'll get to Maya. So Merope was created to be the um the flip side of Tigeta and Alcyon. So Alcyon and Tigeta were more masculine oriented civilizations in 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 the Pleiades. Um and those were the two major systems in the Pleiades. Um but they were very technologically oriented. Electra was also very technologically oriented. So they had to create some systems because the Pleiades are all about balance, you know, so they were all about, you know, we can't have too much emphasis on technology and not enough on spirituality. So they had to create some civilizations that were more feminine oriented and Merope was one of those systems. Um, our concepts of psychotherapy, our concepts of psychospiritual healing originated from Merope. Uh, Merope was very divine feminine. It was very matriarchal. So the women were in charge in Merope. It was mostly priestesses. So these were priestesses that were trained in the deep mysteries, feminine, you know, divine feminine mysteries. Um, and they were more focused on healing the emotions and healing trauma as opposed to the physical healing because Sirius pretty much got this physical healing thing down, you know, so, so Syrian culture was more like, okay, you know, we're going to focus on physical healing because our culture was heavily influenced by, by Vega, whereas the Pleiadians were more heavily influenced by Lyra and the Pleiadian culture they dealt, they had to uh, work through a lot of ancient Lyran trauma because a lot of them had genetics from Lyra. So, um, so they developed these systems in order to help people heal. And the uh, Merope was the home of psychospiritual healing. So that was where the, the concept of, of hypnotherapy came through, you know, working with the emotions and so these priestesses, uh, when I see them in the records, they look like Egyptian priestesses. I mean, they have, you know, very similar, you know, physicality, very similar dress, you know, to the Egyptians. Um, and so these women were, you know, healing beings from the Pleiades and also even beyond the Pleiades. Uh, so, th so these beings would actually visit Merope to receive healing. Um, um, and whenever I looked in the records, there was one planet in Merope that always had three moons. So I always associate Merope with the three moons, um, which is also associated with feminine energy. Um, mm -hmm. Now, Maya was also highly spiritual, highly divine feminine. But Maya was more uh, focused on the integration of spirituality with nature. So this is where we get our concepts of shamanism. And the and we have to keep in mind too that a lot of people have this stereotypical image of Pleiadians being tall and blonde and Nordic looking, and not all of them look like that. Um, the Pleiades actually had a lot of diversity. So there was quite a few darker skinned beings that lived in the Pleiades. Um, and we saw that in Maya, you know, a lot of the Maya Pleiadians looked like indigenous people from Earth. Um, actually, I, I do believe that the indigenous races here on Earth actually descended from the Maya and the Meropian Pleiadians, you know. So um, so this is where we get our concepts of, of shamanism, which uh, played a big part in the early history of Earth. You know, this is where we got um, a lot of our backdrop of healing, of spirituality was from these systems. And so I kind of get irked that, you know, they, people don't talk about it more because I think it's important to understand, you know, that this is a longstanding story. You know, it's not just, oh, yeah, you know, the Lyrans got their butt kicked in the wars and then, you know, they ended up here. You know, it was, it, it, they had a huge influence on many different cultures 
um, not just our earth, but also, um, uh, you know, different cultures throughout the galaxy. So, um, wow. So I just want to tie this into something. My head. That was a long winded just... answer, but I wanted, I wanted to get that out. Cause I, I appreciate, you know, I appreciate it. It's, it's my mind is blown a little bit. So that's why I'm not getting this out fluently. Yeah. So when I first, I was always very spiritual, mm -hmm. but I had judgments about, and definitely a lot of skepticism about UFOs, extraterrestrials to start with and other things. But, you know, I was super open-minded, but very <laughs> closed-minded and skeptical. But that's my awakening story Mm -hmm. to shamanism and everything else. So when the divine first visited me and said years ago, you're a shaman, you're a healer, you're a priestess. And I had no idea what to do with this information. Um, I had a friend who said, let's do some past life regressions. And I was a big eye roller about that. Like, Oh, mm -hmm. really? But thank God, right. Right person for the job. They were able to put me under. So I saw myself as a native male the second time he put me under, which is now what I'm connecting with what you were saying, mm -hmm. I saw myself, I was at least seven feet tall. I was a priestess in a temple and I was Mayan. Now, Debbie, I always assumed that what I was seeing was here on earth, mm -hmm. this Mayan incarnation. Mm -hmm. I never knew this or put any of this together, but I certainly never knew about what you're sharing right now. Yeah. And now I'm realizing this may not have been an earthly incarnation, but mm -hmm. I spent the day with this being. I know what her name is. I saw what she was able to do and it was mind blowing. And she was completely different than any earthling I'd ever seen. Extremely mm -hmm. poised, but didn't need to say or do much, but incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. And so my mind is blown because I'm listening to you and I'm realizing, wow. So maybe this was not an earthbound incarnation in the Mayan civilization here. No. Maybe she was trying to tell me I am Mayan for as Maya. Right. For Maya. for Maya. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we did see that in your last reading too. I think we saw that, you know, that connection with Maya and Merope. So, uh, um, you know, so I do, uh, and it's interesting because, you know, a lot of the, um, a lot of the star seeds that have had incarnations in Merope sometimes end up as psychotherapists or mm -hmm. as, uh, as psychiatrists. Sometimes I see this I'm trend bad. a lot. And then with the Maya people, you know, the people that have had incarnations in Maya, they're always into shamanism. They're always like, you know, oh, I'm a shaman. I had past lives, you know, doing this, you know, it's like they really resonate with that shaman path, you know, so, so, the, so, so this isn't like just a coincidence, you know, I think these are, you know, we're just seeing the, these uncanny synchronicities kind of, kind of coming in. And I'm happy that, you know, even the little bit I shared right now, activated a soul memory for you. That just makes me really, um, warms my heart that, um, it ah, I have another synchronicity for you as well. I yeah. had on my show recently, Elizabeth Araujo. Mm -hmm. So she is a native uh, Mayan, a native elder. And she's mm -hmm. on our cruise in December. She's taking yeah, yeah, us no, to I, the I fire ceremony. Yeah. She's a beautiful soul. And I, I had done some research before she came on and I said, tell me about the Mayan civilization here on earth. I understand that there were four prophets that helped teach about, you know, the sun and many of the very advanced knowledge that the Mayans have had. Mm -hmm. And she said they came from the Pleiadians. Mm -hmm. They were Pleiadians who came mm -hmm. from the Pleiades. Mm -hmm. These were the prophets who taught us everything. And it's like, ugh, it's so full circle and now you're talking about this culture and the mayans and no I, as a matter of fact i you know I, I guess as a galactic historian i note these things but um when my husband and i visited chichen Itza a couple of years ago i noticed that all the temples were either aligned with the pleiades or aligned with venus and i was thinking okay 
that proves it to me that these people were directly influenced by these particular star systems. Um, I mean, it, it was just plain as day, you know, it's just like, wow, you know, it's, I mean, every single one of them was aligned with the Pleiades or with, with, I think there was a couple that was aligned with Venus, but, um, um, and you, we see this even in Tulum, we see this in many different, in, in Machu Picchu, I think a lot of the uh, Machu Picchu temples were aligned with, with the Pleiades as well. Um, so it's just, you know, really across the board and, you know, because these people knew where they came from, you know, they knew, you know, they, this was where their way of connecting with their star families, you know, to have these temples aligned directly with these star systems. Are there specific locations on earth where the Lyran beings influence is particularly, particularly strong or yeah, is I it? I would say, uh, with, um, if you're talking about Vega, I'm going to, I'm going to focus on the white Lyrans, you know, for, for now, we'll talk about Vega in a minute, but if we're talking about white Lyrans, um, I would say they had a bigger influence on Europe. Hmm. Um, so we see kind of a lot of patriarchal heritage with Europe. Um, and I would say uh, the UK, um, Northern Europe in particular, um, and maybe even some parts of Russia, because uh, you see a lot of blonde, you know, blonde, light-skinned people in Eastern Europe, Russia, Northern Europe. Um, we, we don't see a lot of white Lyran in Africa, for instance. Um, that's more vague in Syrian, Orion, you know, genetics there. Um, now, if you're talking about Vega, um, we do see a preponderance of Vega genetics in India. Um, they had a direct effect on Indian culture. Uh, Ayurvedic medicine was a modality that came from Vega. I mean, it, it, it's not just thousands of years old, it's millions of years old. I mean, this is how, how well-versed the Ayurvedic medicine is. I mean, it's a very effective modality because mm. it's been used for millions and millions of years, um, not just thousands of years, millions of years. But, you know, so the Vegans knew what they were doing. Um, and we also see Vega genetics, um, I would say uh, some somewhat in, um, uh, I guess some of the um, Lemuria, I think we do see vegan genetics there, Lemuria. Um, we see it, you know, throughout different parts of earth. Uh, it's kind of interesting because I'm trying to separate Vega from Sirius, whereas, you know, Syrian genetics, we see a lot of in Middle East and Africa um, and, uh, Orion the same way, you know, uh, Egypt was heavily influenced by Sirius and Orion, but Vega particular was more Nepal. Um, it was more, um, I don't know, kind of the, the Western Asian groups. Um, and also I would say the Pacific Rim, you know, that's where we're seeing a lot of Vegan genetics and it's interesting that a lot of those folks have darker skin, you know, because, you know, that's, that's, you know, an offshoot of the, of the vegan genetics, you know, yeah. so it's interesting. Um, I, you know, some, you know, when I teach my Akashic, you know, reading course, we go over the influences of different ET races throughout earth. And it's really interesting to see the differences in culture, you know, like, oh yeah, um, we see a lot of, you know, Tau Cetians in, you know, Eastern Europe, you know, why is that, you know, um, or, um, or we see a lot of Arcturian genetics, maybe in the Pacific Rim, uh, or, you know, some parts of Asia, you know, for instance, you know, so, so there's that as well. Um, but yeah, great question. I, I actually, uh, I, I would love to write a book on, and do like some deep dive research into, you know, the whole history of that. But um, that's a project for another time, I think. Yeah. Oh my God. I, yeah. I would love a book like that. That's amazing. I would yeah, I know. I think we all would. I think it, it'll kind of put a lot of the puzzle pieces together. Um, so are they helping? Are the Lyrans who are here now, 
are they helping, assisting with humanity's preparation for first contact with extraterrestrial civilizations? And just, you know, as a caveat to those who are listening, we are well aware that humanity has been having contact since the beginning of time. But I'm speaking about open, undeniable what is to come soon mm -hmm. in this timeline. How are they prepping? How are we prepping humanity? Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, I do think they've been preparing us for quite a long time. Um, and uh, they say that the Lyrans are here to return us to the original human template. Mm -hmm. This is the 12 strand DNA, the, you know, the, you know, the higher dimensional qualities that we've all lost because, you know, we've been stuck in the 3D for, you know, um, thousands of years, but, um, but they've been, they've been working behind the scenes to energetically prepare us mm -hmm. for this ascension, uh, we say leap, um, and um, and I think they're doing it kind of more subversely rather than directly. I think when they tried to do it in the past directly, um, you know, they got, uh, you know, they, they got ran out of town. You know, they were just, you know, you know, tortured and killed, you know, for bringing in those information because you, you have the, you know, the dark, you know, groups that are wanting to keep us asleep and, you know, kind of like little mushrooms, you know, uh, what they say, you know, mushrooms were kind of uh, covered in shit and in the dark, you know, we're in the dark and covered in shit kind of thing. But, um, but that's changing because um, I do think it's the Larens, it's the Pleiadians, the Syrian, you know, the, the positive Syrian groups that are trying to assist us behind the scenes. Um and they do it through, I would say, different projects. You know, for instance, um, some of the ways they might be helping us is um, mitigating some of the, uh, you know, the negative effects of chemtrails, of GMOs, of the COVID vaccine. Um, they've dismantled, you know, some of the nuclear weapons, you know, so that people we don't blow ourselves up, you know, so... Um, and they've taken down some of the um, underground, uh, what they call the dumbs, you know, the underground hidden, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, little. Uh, 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 gosh, I'm I'm not finding the right word, but the caves or the caverns you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, you know, these are like tunnels places where they're will. doing all these experiments on, you know, human trafficking and experiments on kids and all that, you know, really crazy stuff. They took down a lot of those. Um, so I do think, you know, we are winning this war against dark and light, but maybe it doesn't look like it on the surface, but um, but they are preparing us for contact. Uh, and a lot of the way they're doing that is also energetically. You know, it's like, um, you know, we're seeing humans, more and more humans waking up, more and more, you know, earth humans remembering where their souls originated from and, um, and wanting to be part of this ascension process. Now, the folks that don't want to be a part of this ascension process are going to get attritioned out. Um, that's happening even as we speak, where we're just seeing a lot of deaths lately. You know, like every day we're hearing about this person died and these people are dying and this person is leaving the planet. And I don't think that's just a coincidence. I think it's that it wasn't part of their contract, you know, so... They're choosing to leave the planet and they are um, going to a different earth reality. Um, so it's not like any soul gets really left behind. You know, it's, mm -hmm. you know, we, we all want to give people, you know, and all souls a chance to ascend, but they may not be ready for it now. So um, I know I talked about this a little bit with Ishmael, speaking of Ishmael Perez. So, um, mm -hmm. so we had a good conversation about that, but um I know yeah. that you recently, you just literally just taught a webinar on galactic relationships. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that was fascinating. Um, I think that's a whole it was new over way three of, hours worth of information. <laughs> unreal. Was, um, yeah, it was a lot. Yeah. And so just if people are interested, can they go to your website to listen to it or where would they find it? 
So um, we're going to be posting that on my website. So we we just uploaded it onto Kajabi. So it'll be available for pay for, for play kind of thing. Beautiful. It's like over three hours of Wow. a lot of information. So cool. So it's I love that take on dating and relationships, marriages or being single, whatever anyone chooses. Yeah, no, it's it's one that I think a lot of us struggle with. I know I have. I mean, it's I think we all have it to some level, to some degree, but um Well, what about the Lyrans? What should we know? The piece, someone who's in a relationship with a Lyran, interested in a Lyran, is a Lyran. What should we know about what anything you want to share? But I always think it's interesting what makes us hard to be with, easy to be with. What should we be looking for? What do we resonate or not resonate with? Yeah, I know. I um I love that because I've done a lot of readings for Lyrans and Vegans and they have their own unique, you know, perspective on and you know, I would say challenges with relationships. Uh so one of the things I taught and I'm happy to share this with you and your group because I think it's really important is I taught the concept of relationship arcs. That's a a r c um, arcs. Uh, so what what is a relationship arc? It's a trend, you know. So when you're creating a story, I know you probably know this because you're a writer, but when you're creating a story, you also oftentimes create a character arc. Like how does this character develop? Well, how does this relationship develop? And so. As you know, throughout the years, I've done a lot of these Akashic readings. I was noticing trends with Vagans and, and Larens. And one of the things I noticed is they oftentimes are attracted to each other. You know, like um, it's kind of like they are very similar in relationship style and they come from the same star system, you know, constellation. So they're really and they kind of balance each other out because there's some you know differences between them but there's also a lot of similarities um and so one of the things i've noticed with the vegans and lyrans is that in relationships lyrans in general tend to be very open hearted i mean they just wear their heart on their sleeve in relationships they just They just love, you know, it's not like an invasive kind of love, but they just love people where they're at, you know, and um, so they're usually very open hearted. They're very emotional, um, very warm people in relationships. And I would say the vegans to a certain extent are the same way, but they might be a little more reserved. So they might it might take them a little bit longer to open up than Elaren, but Um, but what I see as far as their challenges is that oftentimes between, and I would say this is even true of a Lyran with another star person. So it doesn't necessarily have to be vegan. I just use that as an example for the arc. But, um, but what I see as far as their challenges is oftentimes what is the downfall of this relationship arc is with the Lyrans is that if they get in a relationship where the their missions are not aligned or the lifestyles are not aligned. That's what will create a wedge in the relationship. It's not from a lack of love because both of these star races have a lot of love to give and to receive. Um, but it's the, uh, the conflict between, Oh, I want to do this, but I want to do that. Um, so oftentimes what we're seeing, um, let's say if we're using a Laren and a Vagan in a relationship, is that the vegan oftentimes will become really esoteric. They want to follow their mission, their spiritual mission. And the Lyran is like, hey, we got to pay the bills. We got, you know, we got stuff going on. We got to talk about our physical, you know, material issues that we have, you know, because we, we all, we're all living on planet Earth, you know, and, you know, those things are important too. Uh, so, You might get this vegan, and sometimes I see it reversed as well. Like sometimes it's the Lyran that might want to pursue their their deep spiritual passion. But so you see this a uh, vegan um, that is wanting to go up in the mountaintop and study with the I don't know the the gurus of Nepal or something, and then you got this this poor Lyran person that's left behind. You know, that's like. 
well, what happened? You know, so, so that's some of the challenges I see is kind of the difference in, in, uh, lifestyles. Um, um, one of the positive aspects with this relationship type is that Laren's oftentimes, um, they are kind of like cheerleaders, you know, they just, um, really love to help people. They love to be helpful. I know I've seen that with you. You, you just help everybody. It's like, you don't even charge people. You're just like, here, let me give you some really valuable advice. And, and I know I've seen that with you a lot of times, you, you know, just not, not just with your interactions with me, but with a lot of different people. And I think, um, um, you know, these two types, um, with the, with the Lyrans, they're more action oriented. So they really motivate the, the vegan soul, um, or any soul actually, um, uh, the vegans on the other hand, um, they bring a sense of continuity and stability to the relationship. So they're a little bit more reflective, you know, they, they think about things on, on a deeper level. So, um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but that's kind Is of Neil how Gore a vegan who Neil, so we always called him Neil Gar, G-A-U-R, but I found out recently G-A-U-R is pronounced Gore. So oh, Neil Gore, our amazing event producer from Portal to Ascension, is he a vegan? I kind of get with him that he's more Arcturian. Um, oh. I know he identifies as Arcturian, but okay. he might have had um, a mission with Vega because I do see a little bit of that vegan component within him. Um that he's very, very reflective and he's, he's kind of reserved. I mean, he's not super open and, and Arcturians generally aren't either. I mean, I think we're, we're kind of reserved as well to a certain extent, but, um, but I do think his origination is Arcturus, but he might've had some missions and some lifetimes in Vega. Mm -hmm. I see him more kind of in the Vegan spectrum as, as opposed to the Laren, if that makes sense. I, um, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I wondered. Well, I'm going to take a pause here before I launch into another question, because we are both going to be on October 5th at the Liren conference. It is online. So anybody can join anywhere. Mm -hmm. And folks who are interested, you can go to portal to ascension dot org. Just mm -hmm. click on the event Liren conference. Um, Debbie, what are you presenting for that conference. Do you know? <laughs> yeah, I do know. And I'm actually going to be putting together the presentation in the next couple of weeks, but um, I'm going to be talking about kind of the deeper dive information about Lyra. Um, I think a lot of us already know the story, you know, of their history. So I want to get kind of even beyond underneath the history, you know, so what was the psychological components that was going on with these Lyran vegan folks? And, uh, and what, how does that influence earth today? You know, so, um, uh, so a lot of this is going to be, you know, kind of deep diving into the, some of the trauma signatures and some of the issues that we as humans today on earth deal with because of what happened in Lyra. Um, so it's going to be kind of a deeper dive than what I've done in the past, where I've just basically talked about the history. So I think it's going to be an interesting presentation. Um, I'm kind of formulating it as we speak. It's something I wanted to talk about for quite a while. So uh, so it's going to be kind of a surprise, but kind of fun at the same time. So I can't um, wait. I cannot wait to hear what you have to say. Yeah. Um, yeah, because this is already so tremendous. So again, folks, this is Neil Gore, who is producing the event and anyone who knows him will, you know, he has so many followers and he does such beautiful work. He is the guy for the job, the one with the huge vision who puts massive events like this together for all of us. And I have to say, they're always incredibly well priced. Like they're not expensive. So really, anyone oh, I can know. join. Oh, I know. Yeah. Um, and Flo Karuna is kind of co-hosting it. He's with Star Codes, and Flo's a a Laren. He's through so a Laren. Yes. Love Flo. He's and he's so open-hearted, so warm, and he just you know really I think exemplifies that Laren love energy and. Uh, 
he's going to be part of this conference as well. Um, I haven't met uh, Neil in person yet. I hope to soon, you know, but, um, but I, I have met Flo and um, as, as, as Debbie has, and he's, he's amazing as well. So you're going to get some really, and actually Lissa Royale Holt is going to also be um, part of this conference and, She's kind of the originator of all the Laren history. So Wisdom of Lyra. Yeah. So she'll probably, we don't know. We never know with Lisa who is showing up. Um, my guess is that it will be Sasha, but it could be Jermaine or Hamon. Mm -hmm. um, I love everybody who comes through her. So it's going to be no matter what, very powerful. So folks, please join us because it's an all day conference with, an, with a stellar lineup of folks like Debbie, like Lisa, et cetera, sharing. Um, okay, so that's it for that, for folks who want to join us on October 5th. Um, and it's online, so you don't have to travel anywhere. I mean, you could do it from the comfort of your own home. So it's, can't, you know, I, I do love the in-person events, but sometimes it's just nice to do an online because then everybody can attend. And uh, like Debbie was saying, it's very reasonably priced. I mean, it's can't, you can't, you can't get this kind of lineup in person for the price that we're, we're offering it. Exactly. Um, yeah. Unbelievable. So yeah, I will be apt and wrapped. I can't wait to hear what you're going to bring beyond what you're giving today. So beautifully. I think the last question I'm going to ask Debbie is, uh, is there a Lyran perspective on the multidimensional nature of reality and how it differs from our current understanding. And I know I throw these unreal questions at you. And if I didn't know that you get out of the way sometimes and channel these downloads, I would never do this to you during a- No, that's a deep question, but I'm gonna have to check in with my guides on that one because I- Please. Um, I don't know. I, I have to check in. Let me let me just check in with the guides and see what they tell me. Um, uh, so this might take a minute here. Um, so the lion perspective. perspective. Um, so what I'm seeing, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm kind of seeing in, in relation to this question, and this is uh, what the guides are uh, downloading to me right now, is that we're getting kind of a reformulation of that original human template um, where it's going to be more, um, let me see if I can find the right word for this, where it's gonna be not like the original, but it's gonna be an upgrade of the original. And the only place they could do this was planet Earth. That's why there's so many star races that were interested in Earth because Earth was one of the few planets where we could uh, bring in different DNA from different systems and mesh it all together. Um, we don't see this in other systems, um, except maybe Orion, but even Orion was limited. Um, uh, but, um, but here on Earth, uh, they're bringing in all these different star um, lineages, different star genetics in order to reformulate the original human template to an even more diverse but yet higher version of the original, which was coming from Lyra and Vega. So, um, and this is going to happen on a multi-dimensional level, where there's going to be like these multi-dimensional aspects of this. Uh, um, so that's what they're downloading to me right now, and. Uh, I do think it's going to happen more energetically. Like in the past, I think they tried to do it physically and they got a lot of pushback from the powers to be and, you know, got killed and, and uh, tortured for this information. So they're doing it more subversely. And I do, and the other download I'm getting is that this is a lot of the work that we're seeing from the inner earth beings, you know, that the inner earth beings are part of this project. Mm -hmm. Um, that was just a little little tidbit of information that kind of slipped in. So I don't know, personally, I don't know much about the inner earth beings. There's other speakers that are, I think, more well-versed, but my understanding is that a lot of these inner earth beings had direct connections with Lyra. So, um, yeah. 
That is amazing. Thank you. That was yeah, thank you. Thank really you guides for helping me out. Yes. So, um, my darling, I cannot wait to go on vacation with you in December. Yeah, it's going to be a blast. We're going to have so much fun. I just want and, to talk about that for a moment for yeah. folks who aren't aware that they have an opportunity to be with Debbie Solaris, Debbie Dashinger, Jerry Sargent, Laura Eisenhower, Lori Spagna. I mean, there's an uh, JK Ultra. There's so many people. I, there's so 22 many presenters. It's, it's just like, I don't know, over 20 amazing speakers. I mean, if not more, um, on the galactic origins cruise, um, when Neil Gore, I guess that's how you pronounce his name, told me about the galactic origins cruise, I said, Oh my God, that was tailor made for me. You got to, I mean, he actually asked me to be on and I was like, yeah, sign me up. You know, uh, I don't even care where it goes. I just want to be <laughs> part of it, you know? And then I found out it was going to the Yucatan. It was going to Cozumel and Belize and Honduras. So it's going to be an amazing, amazing cruise. And it's going to be, uh, a, a great opportunity to not only have a nice vacation, although, you know, there's going to be a lot of beautiful excursions and opportunities to connect with other star seeds, but it's also going to be an opportunity to be one-on-one -on -one with your favorite speakers and, you know, mentors, you know, so it's great. Uh, so Debbie and I will be there. We're going to be partying it up probably. <laughs> so, um, and uh, I think um, my team is going to be there, at least my, my core team. I, I know Ann and Powers are coming. And uh, I think a lot of people that know me know Ann and Powers because they see them on my webinars. But uh, and uh, there's going to be lots of great folks. So. Um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. If you haven't um, sign up, you can either sign up under me or under Debbie. It doesn't really matter whoever you want to, but it doesn't really matter sign up under Debbie because this is her show. So, um, but well, I just want to, some amazing points about the cruise. One of yeah. them, you know, I know we've kind of, everybody has joshed about it, joked about it, but I'm actually getting more deeply intrigued by the idea that the first day the cruise ship is going through the Bermuda triangle. Mm -hmm. And I just watched a channeler tell this unbelievable story I'll just tell it here because it really is fascinating. Yeah. And it's about a real uh, gentleman who was working on some very covert, uh, but positive. He was a positive human, mm -hmm. uh, UFO stuff for the government. And then he got wind, you know, that the government, because of all his knowledge, was going to come after him. He was on a cruise, true story. He was going through the Bermuda Triangle and he was thinking about, wow, you know, if I make it through this cruise, they're probably going to come after me and do me in because they don't mm -hmm. want my knowledge to get out there. And he literally had a thought about what would that be like if I wasn't here, not understanding that he was coinciding with going through the Bermuda Triangle. So the, the channel was saying he literally, it was like he saw something on the sunset, didn't quite know what to make of it, but what had happened was he had jumped timelines. Mm. So he went somewhere where nobody was gonna go after him, mm. lived the rest of his life out, Anyway, I thought that was pretty fascinating that you could in that moment or those moments while you're crossing through, I don't know, choose a different, more benevolent, more loving, peaceful, <laughs> a flushed kind of timeline for yourself. Um, I think anything's possible. So that's yeah, totally. on one side. And the other side is doing our meditation on the 21st of yeah. December for the solstice all together on the ship. Yeah, no, that's going to be amazing. Just, um, you know, not just the timeliness of it, but also for all of us being together at the same time, you know, in the middle of the Atlantic, you know, so it's going to be, so, so we're going to be connecting with some Atlantean energies in addition to the Bermuda Triangle, but, uh, and also speaking of Mayans, you know, we're actually going deep into Mayan land with the Yucatan and Cozumel and, you know, those locations, you know, even uh, Belize and Honduras to a certain extent. Uh, and uh, so there's going to be a lot and there's, there's going to be amazing excursions as well. You know, so uh, I think the Hurtax are leading one of the excursions. Yeah. Right. Uh, 
Yes. Oh my gosh. Thank you for reminding me because there really are some incredible people speaking yeah. and leading on this. You know, if you want to join us and the others, and in my estimation, timing wise, I've always been about how am I ending my year? Because that's what sets up my new year. Mm -hmm. And so if you're ready to go out with these you know, just these incredible spiritual tribe that you're connecting with at meals and in workshops. And there's even the opportunity to have individual sessions with people. Exactly. So go to galacticoriginscruise.com and sign up galacticoriginscruise.com. Sign up under Debbie Solaris. Sign up under Debbie Dashinger. We would love to have you there, to get to know you. And um, there are people listening to the show I've never met who have already typed in the comments, I'm going to see you there. I signed up because I love this. So if you're loving this, we'd love to have you there. Um, it's going to be beautiful. And again, another Neil Gore production. So he Oh, yeah, no, he is. Out. He's the mastermind of amazing events. I tell you what, it's going to be super amazing um and i think it's just going to get even better next year you know mm. so um but i wouldn't you know uh count on next year so much i mean if you have the opportunity to go this year i would go this year you know? yeah i've never been to these i've been many places i've never been specifically to all the locations we're going in the yucatan plus to do the mayan fire ceremony with the mm. native elder and um tulum and so forth i'm very excited and Debbie, I want to ask you a personal question I've never asked you before. Okay. What do you do on a daily basis that keeps you grounded? Is there a ritual? Is there a practice you do also to keep you so receptive to the information that you receive? Nobody's ever asked that of me. And I'm glad you did because mm -hmm. um, actually, yeah, I, I'm a lot of ways I'm very ordinary. You know, I'm just, you know, human having a, you know, nice little human life, but and I have a nice little relationship with my longtime partner. But I think a lot of what I do is I do meditate every day. Um, the Arcturians kind of drummed that into me. I, I was really resistant to doing meditation. And I, I do meditate. And I spend a lot of time in the Akashic Records. So when I'm, you know, putting together these presentations and these, uh, you know, these, uh, inf you know, these, this content that I'm, you know, I put out, um, I'm oftentimes tapping into the records. Um, in addition to doing personal readings for people, uh, just a little note about personal readings. I'm not doing them on a massive level like I did in the past, but I will go back to doing, um, them on a limited basis, but it, it's going to be primarily for the folks that are, um, I have been on my list for quite a while. Um, so uh, you're welcome to join the list, but it's going to be a long, long list. I'm just letting you know that. But um, I may open it up to do some readings on the cruise. I mean, that might be a possibility. But the other thing I do is I really consistently um, focus on self-care. That was something that I never really done that much in the past. Um, I would just run myself ragged and... Uh, so a lot of what I do now is um, um, I really take really good care of myself because my my health was in the, uh, I got, you know, I got run into the ground. I was, you know, diagnosed with cancer and all kinds of other issues. Um, so self-care and I do, you know, the Acturians do teach that you got to uh, build up your body in order to expand your mind. I mean, we, we are living in these physical human bodies, you know, so in order for us to maintain that higher dimensional connection, we do need to stay grounded and stay connected within our bodies and take good care of them because there are vehicles for this incarnation. Um, I ask what kind of uh, meditation specifically you do that works for you? Well, I was trained by the Zen Buddhists, so my meditation style is more the Zen Buddhist style, um, and it's kind of a hard discipline. You know, you have to sit a certain way, and it's. But both Terry and I, uh, my my partner, we we were trained, and so um, I don't know if he's consistently, you know, stayed with the training, but I did because that's my way of connecting with the higher realms and my higher self. Amazing. Well, I just have to say, while you were sharing, 
Debbie, just here at the end, these questions, there is a God angel light coming over you. You'll have to see it. I know, I see it. Yeah, That's unbelievable. It's not like it's a blinding light. It's literally a circle that was framing your face in here and with offshoots of rays. So like, yeah, they're connecting with us. They are. It is so beautiful. Yeah. And if you guys want to join us for the cruise, they'll, they'll, they'll be connecting with you as well. You know, so um, we're going to, I think we're going to have like some, I don't know, CE5 events or I don't know. We're going to do some, some. That's correct. We're doing some contact UFO contact. Yeah, we are. Yeah. Based on Stephen Greer's work and all of that. Yes. uh, Galacticoriginscruise.com. And if you want to check out the amazing Debbie Solaris, please do go to Debbie Solaris. It's so easy to spell.com. And um, Deb, anything here at the end you would like to say to close us out? Um, since uh, I would say since we're featuring on uh, the Larens, um, I would say we have to understand our past in order to move forward for our future. And the ultimate, uh, I would say, destination of our past was the Larens. But um, the Larens are also going to be a part of our future as uh, as we become deeper connected with our galactic heritage and our galactic families. So Ooh, that was a little cliffhanger. Will you include some of that in your presentation at the Liren conference? What, how the Lirans are going to play into the future? Oh, absolutely. I can't wait to do that. Yeah. So if you want to go to that portals to ascension.org, if you want to join Debbie and I on a freaking vacation for seven days, I mean, I'm amazed actually at how many Americans don't take vacations. I live for this. I just, that's part of self-care to me is to take time off. Oh, it off. is. No, I totally 100% agree. Um, I think um, in order for us to evolve and grow, we need to create adventures and opportunities in our lives to have great adventures. And what greater adventure than to join a cruise with a bunch of star seeds, you know, so... <laughs> And to join us at the Lyran conference too, you know, that's always, that's always available as well. So thank you, Deb, for having on us, me on. This was a lot of fun. I, you, you, you always ask the most interesting questions and kind of stretches my, my mind, but um, I, I love that. So thank you. Thank you for being on so deeply and willing to come play with me to preempt the Lyran conference with some Lyran information delivered as only you can, Debbie. And I end today's show with this quote from Steve Noble. This is a Lyran starseed transmission clearing imprints. This clearing is initiated, clearing any programming, imprints, and dense energies relating to the destruction of the home planet. Also, anything related to being a constant wanderer, explorer, and that nowhere felt safe to put down roots for long, clearing any agreements, programming, imprints, and dense energies relating to galactic conflict and war, clearing all programming, imprints, and dense energies relating to Lyran interference in the development of other races in different planetary systems, including the Earth. That is so powerful. I feel it. Yeah, me too. Yeah. And I love Steve Noble. So that was a perfect uh, quote to end with. Yeah. Thank you, Steve, wherever you be in England right now. Mm. Ah, And thank you, Debbie Solaris. Folks, subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, your weekly Dare to Dream podcast. Leave a message, a comment, subscribe. It means a lot and helps others who need this conversation to find it. Next week on the show, I'm speaking with the phenomenal Vidika Kulhoff, who channels Arjun of the Ya Yell. I hope you enjoyed this really special episode with Debbie Solaris and Debbie Dashinger, and especially the amazing Debbie Solaris bringing in all that phenomenal information for those of you who want so much to know more about the Lyran galactic history. Join us on the cruise, galacticoriginscruise.org. Join us at the upcoming Lyran conference on October 5th. Go to portaltoascension.org and definitely check out the beautiful Debbie Solaris and all of what she offers on her website at debbiesolaris.com. 
Peace out everyone who's Lyran or who has the genetics within you, which is all of us. We are truly all related.